Thank you. Thank you, Governor uh, Ueda and uh, Gaijuka san for giving me a chance to moderate uh, this uh, uh, Mayakawa lecture. And it's my great honor to introduce my colleagues and friends, Mori. Mori doesn't need any introduction to you, but for Kultiji, I want to briefly highlight a few of his notable achievements. Mori is currently the class of 1958 professor of economics at UC Berkeley. He was a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors and very respected uh, chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. And as Governor Ueda mentioned, has been an honorary advisor to the Bank of Japan's Institute of Monetary and Economic Studies and also member of California Governor's Council of Economic Advisors. And I can continue go and go. On, but also he is a uh, also of the two leading textbook on international economics. I still have a your graduate, you know, textbook which is to me is a bible of my international economics. So if I know something about economics, credit goes you. <laughs> and so, so uh, I think it will be impossible to impress the entirety of his contribution in you know, this brief uh, introduction. So having, I think I will just stop here. I will pause. And then I will listen from your lecture, and maybe you have a 30 plus minutes, and then you, you will have a, a, a Q and A from the floor. Maybe. Uh, <clears throat> it's it's a very uh, unusual pleasure and honor to be back here in this room. Uh, uh, Governor Ueda, thank you for your introduction. You make, made me feel very old. Um, uh, in fact, you and I go back to graduate school, so uh, we lived through the 70s uh, together to some extent. Uh, uh, it's also a, a particular pleasure to be um, in a session uh, moderated by my friend and uh, former IMF colleague, Chang Yong. And of course, uh, I also worked closely with Kaisuka san at the, at the IMF. So um, uh, this is this is a uh, uh, brings back many 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 memories. Um, one memory I'd like to share with you, and uh, Governor Ueda actually mentioned mentioned this um, occasion. This is the first Mayakawa lecture uh, uh, when I was an honorary advisor. Um, uh, this project, uh, this lectureship, was suggested by the. Uh, the IMES, and the first um, uh, lecturer was John, John Taylor, who lectured on the way back to stability and growth in the global economy. Um, looking back at that conference, it occurred at a very delicate stage in the world economy between Bear Stearns and Lehman. Uh, and you could, you could suggest perhaps it was the calm before the storm, but it was actually a not very calm moment. And in some ways, it was, it was uh, analogous to the kinds of pressures we have seen uh, recently, uh, certainly in terms of inflationary pressures, which were very much on our mind and on uh, John Taylor's mind at that time. Uh, also, the circumstances then and the circumstances now um, bore some similarities to Governor Mayakawa's term, which was a very eventful term. Think, think of the events between 1979 and 1984. And by the way, that's Governor Mayakawa, not John Taylor, if you're confused about that. Um, indeed, uh, we did not know then, in May of 2008, that um, a U.S. recession had started the previous December because the recession was not called by the NBER until uh, December of of 2000, 2008. But the, the BOJ staff, very excellent BOJ staff, did a summary of uh, Professor Taylor's Mayakawa lecture. And um, it's just remarkable to um, uh, read the list of problems that were identified and that everyone more or less agreed with who was sitting in the room. High and rising global inflation, financial stability risks, high and rising prices of energy, food, and many imbalances. Uh, just parenthetically, um, uh, 2008 was a, uh, uh, a notable spike in food prices, which created social unrest around the world. 
the price of oil reached more than $130 per barrel. So you can understand why, in the face of these commodity shocks, there was so much concern. And uh, it, it was a concern that spilled over into subsequent central bank decision, decision making uh, and uh, possibly even has influence today. Uh, current account imbalances, number four, and globally inconsistent exchange rate policies. Uh, and finally, rising protectionism and isolationist sentiment. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Um, uh, he, made, he made a strong link to Governor Mayakawa's holistic approach to policy, the idea that all of these problems are interconnected. And even though monetary policy cannot address all of them, it's important for the central banker to have a, a holistic view. Uh, one more parallel with recent events. Um, on the second day of the conference, May 29th, Bear Stearns' shareholders approved the company's sale at $10 per share to J.P. Morgan Chase. So uh, note, tout ça change, tout c'est la même chose. Uh, Lehman happened a few months later, and to some extent that, that feeds into the discussion of real interest rates that is the topic of this, of this paper. So let me start with where we are now. Uh, I summarize here some of the recent inflationary developments, um, with the, the, the red bars being uh, headline and the gray um, sort of moving mass uh, is core. Um, you're all familiar, familiar with this, and you see that um, the experience looks quite similar in, in, uh, in Korea and in the EU uh, with, with uh, uh, core now exceeding um, headline. Uh, in the US, inflation started earlier, uh, in Japan later, but even Japan's inflation, uh, core inflation has risen, risen to the 3% range. Uh, the suddenness of these events is best appreciated by looking at a longer historical period in which for many years the um, challenge uh, to central banks was the, the, the inability to, to get rates low enough to reach inflation targets from, from below. Uh, the left-hand chart shows policy interest rates. And at the beginning of this chart, which is roughly 2008, you, you, can, you can see on the right-hand side the inflation pressures that were, um, were prevalent at the time and why there was so much worry. Uh, of course, interest rates remained low. And then in response to the recent inflation hike, they've been raised uh, very, very rapidly to, to much higher levels. But uh, you know, every central bank is asking the question, are they, are, they, are they high enough? Do they have to go higher? And what is the um, neutral or natural rate of interest? which brings me to the topic of the talk. Um, the topic of the, the natural rate has been um, widely discussed since Wicksell, really, in 1898, although the basic idea goes back to Henry Thornton's treatise in 1802. And uh, it was given a very compelling analytical foundation by Mike Woodford in his magisterial book on monetary policy in 2003. Um, the idea is that, that it's sort of a Goldilocks rate. The economy is neither too hot or too cold. It's just right. And it provides a uh, lodestar for, for monetary policy. Uh, Claudio Borio, uh, in, a, in a recent paper, points out that um, in 2015, the, the, the number of mentions of the natural or neutral rate in central bankers' speeches uh, reached double digits, and it has kept rising until then. So clearly, this is a topic that is on uh, policymakers' minds. But how can we measure it? Uh, back uh, in the late 1990s, uh, a famous paper by Clarita Gertley, uh, Clarita Gali and Gertler talked about the science of monetary policy. And uh, more than two decades later, we're still 
struggling with the science, and I, I, I argue that monetary policy uh, probably still remains largely an art, uh, but in, an informed art. Uh, we would also like to know about the future, and to do that, we need to understand the driving forces of natural or neutral, neutral rates. Um, there's a wonderful quote from John H. Williams that I first saw in a paper, a Brookings paper by Athanasios and John C. Williams, not to be confused with John H. Um, John H. Williams, together with Alvin Hansen, taught money and banking to uh, Jim Tobin at Harvard when he was a graduate student. Of course, Tobin was one of the first two um, honorary advisors. Uh, so um, this, this stretches way back. But what Williams wrote in this great quote is that the natural rate is an abstraction like faith that is seen by its works. One can only say that if the bank policy succeeds in stabilizing prices, the bank rate must have been brought in line with the natural rate. But if it does not, it must not have been. So that, that leaves us um, you know, with a lot of, a lot of analytical, analytical work to do. And there, there are a number of approaches have, that have been developed to um, assessing what the correct rate must have been or is at the moment or will be in the future. Um, one of these is estimating long-run forecasts or trends by non-structural time series models. A second is to look at uh, asset prices, for example, uh, uh, indexed uh, security yields, um, which is problematic if you don't have a, an index bond market, but useful for, um, for some countries and to use a term structure model to extract uh, uh, the long run expected real interest rate. Um, some studies look at a uh, flexible price equilibrium from a DSGE model or some other type of model to extract the rate. And one of the most famous methods, which was updated uh, by the New York Fed on May 19th after having been suspended in the middle of COVID, is the semi-structural approach pioneered by Laubach and Williams and also by Holston, Laubach and Williams. Uh, one, one thing all of these approaches share is generally high ranges of uncertainty. Um, as a conceptual matter, I would like to distinguish between what I call R bar and R star. Uh, the literature uses natural or neutral pretty interchangeably, but I think it's useful to distinguish between some notion of the long run equilibrium rate, uh, which you might infer from a time series non-structural model or some other way from an asset pricing model, and R star, the rate that the central banker would want to set the, um, uh, the policy instrument at to, uh, to reach a neutral monetary stance. Um, if you look at the methods I set out, only method four directly and empirically addresses inflation control. In some models, uh, it may be that R bar and R star are the same. I don't want to call that a divine coincidence, uh, but, but it is a coincidence. But in reality, I would argue that there are several different reasons why R bar might not, might not equal R star. Uh, uh, the long run trends that you get from these different methods certainly are consistent in some ways, but there are also very big divergences. For example, the uh, Laubach-Williams method gives you much higher uh, estimates of R star than some of the uh, 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 time series methods like Lubick Math Mathis is a non-structural time series, the R method, uh, Damico, Kim, and Y is a term structure model. And you can see there are gaps and differences, some of which are persistent and significant. Uh, conceptually, uh, a number of factors might drive a wedge between R bar and R star. Uh, financial conditions, which I would uh, uh, argue comprise capital accounts shocks, imperfect credibility. Uh, maybe the, the central bank is trying to signal to markets that it is uh, serious about getting inflation down or signal its, uh, its intentions. 
And that might call for a higher level of the policy um, uh, rate than some estimate of the one one equilibrium rate. Um, most estimation methods don't adequately account for open economy factors, but I think these are very important uh, for, for most economies. I would argue even for the US, they're important to take into account. And of course, these global factors have been all important in determining real rates. And the, to me, the smoking gun evidence of this is just the common downward trend in uh, real interest rates uh, since the 1980s. Now, uh, these are ex post rates in this chart, or I'd say they're semi, semi ex post rates. Uh, the accompanying paper explains how I calculate them, but you can think of them as ex post rates without uh, doing too much violence. And the, the, the trend is very clear, although very recently, uh, as inflation has outstripped um, uh, government bond yields in the long term, uh, which these are long term rates, uh, you get some, some very negative numbers. This is also true if you look at emerging markets. Here's a, an average of a, a 20 plus emerging market rates. And you see a, a, a downward trend for the most part, uh, at least since the, the, uh, the beginning of the millennium. Uh, but uh, interestingly, for emerging markets, uh, real rates have not uh, continued to fall after the global financial crisis. Again, until very recently, when you have this spike of inflation, which, uh, which occurs, occurs everywhere. So how do we want to think about the experience? Um, a basic and well-known framework is the Metzler model uh, of global saving and global investment. Um, everyone has seen this. Uh, whatever shifts saving curves anywhere to the right uh, depresses global real interest rates. Whatever shifts investment curves uh, anywhere to the left does the same. And this is the basic framework for thinking about how global uh, interest rates are determined uh, by the aggregation of national, national shocks. Uh, but this is not the entire story. Uh, and I think, I think it's a mistake to, to think about developments in terms of this alone because the, the composition of saving and investment, I would argue, also matter greatly. And um, uh, in fact, preference shifts can have large effects on bond rates, risk-free government borrowing rates, and returns on different assets could diverge. And perhaps exhibit, exhibit A of this is the um, divergence between returns on equity and returns on bonds where the former have remained much more stable over time. Um, what does the historical record tell us? Well, one, one paper that I found to be very uh, useful and clear-headed on this is by uh, Caballero Fari and Pierre Olivier sitting, sitting over there. And um, uh, I think they correctly identify a lot of the factors. And I also like their um, message that um, and really different factors are at work in different epochs. There's no sort of one uh, uniform driver of all this or, or really drivers that are necessarily operative over all times. And so I think to understand this, this is one of the reasons why I find some of the regression evidence unpersuasive. Like when, when, you, when you try to, uh, to you know, ask whether um, a certain factor is important over a long period, um, you know, in some cases, uh, centuries, um, uh, th there are structural changes and different factors matter at different times. So if we look at the uh, epoch from the 90s to the Asian crisis, demographics were a big factor, the peak of the baby boomer, work careers, growing inequality, falling price of capital goods, growing corporate market power, which would reduce investment and increase increased saving. Um, if we go to a next epoch from roughly the end of the 90s, the Asia crisis to the global uh, financial crisis, uh, this is the period in which Ben Bernanke famously highlighted the global saving glut. But one could argue 
and uh, Yun Shin has and others have that there was a global liquidity glut at the, tame, at the same time. And that this might be as important or more important than uh, saving. Uh, easy global liquidity in deregulated markets uh, certainly helped set the stage for the global financial crisis. The creation of the euro area and the easing of liquidity conditions there, the fall in yields of peripheral countries once the um, currencies were locked, I think is a major factor in the global um, set of developments. Uh, high Chinese growth played a role. Um, I think it helped drive Chinese saving, which I'll show you a chart in a moment, was remarkable. Energy prices rose in this period. And official foreign exchange reserve accumulation was also a factor. Uh, once the GFC hits, uh, things change. Reserve accumulation abates, but private safe asset demand uh, likely rises in a very turbulent environment. Uh, there's the euro crisis, uh, large cuts in public investment and in uh, budgets in Europe, um, low productivity growth, aging workforces with positive neg possible negative effects on investment. Um, regulation may have played a role, although uh, I would argue that the, the kind of regulations put in place by Basel III cut both ways in terms of how we would think about the effects on safe rates of interest. So different factors for different, different periods. Uh, the 2000s is really a key period leading up to the global financial crisis, uh, which I think itself uh, had persistent effects on real interest rates. And one of, the, one of the amazing facts about international capital markets in that time is the rise of Chinese saving. Um, uh, by, by the uh, current uh, time, if you look at where we are now, uh, Chinese saving is, is one third of global saving, and it's more than a half of emerging market saving. So um, this has been a remarkable development, and I think one we probably need to stand, understand more. Of course, saving is not the only factor here, because uh, saving will not uh, reduce long-term interest rates if investment rises in tandem, according to the Metzler model. But uh, we did have a huge divergence of global imbalances starting in the late, in the late 90s. Um, and uh, 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 you can see that by the mid-2000s, um, Chinese uh, surpluses were, were very high. Um, oil exporting surpluses were very high. Uh, the surpluses of other emerging markets were not that high. And the deficit of the advanced countries was, was, uh, was very high was very high. Um, foreign exchange reserve accumulation was important. The left-hand side here shows uh, accumulation of reserves by uh, emerging markets in, uh, in brown and in blue advanced economies. Most of the action is from uh, emerging market reserves. But um, this really abates after about uh, 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 the late two, the late two thousands, around the time of the global of the global financial crisis. So I would argue this is probably not a big factor after the global financial crisis. Um, there are implications here for the global saving glut theory. I don't want to really go deeply because we don't have a lot of time. But if you if you look back at that chart of current accounts, you'll see that the advanced countries go into strong deficit before the Chinese and oil exporter surpluses really get, really get going. Uh, and I think that cuts against the theory that somehow the US deficit was driven by external, external events. And Ken Rogoff and I have argued, in fact, that um, uh, the US deficit was, was, was in not inconsiderable part generated domestically and one factor might have been a very accommodative stance by the Fed. If you look back at those estimates I showed you of the Holston, Laubach, Williams, R star, um, they're, they're actually considerably above where Fed policy rates actually were 
in the early in the early 2000s. Um, what about the um, open economy aspects? I don't want to linger too long on this because it's a it's really a big topic and uh, just how to take the open economy uh, into account uh, is um, uh, not something that's really settled. Um, uh, there is a uh, recent WIO, uh, IMF WIO chapter that, uh, that looks at this. There's a paper by uh, Mark Wynn and a co-author, uh, Mark is in the room, that looks at this. So researchers are starting to come to, to grips with it, but just in terms of a very, very simple model, a kind of a, a non-traded, traded goods model, a la Salter and Swan, um, you know, if a, if, a, if a country has a big net export surplus, uh, it will be uh, uh, consuming uh, less uh, compared to what its budget would allow it to consume under balanced trade. And uh, the real exchange rate will be um, uh, depreciated. Uh, following that, when the country runs a, uh, a deficit to, to uh, uh, eat the assets it has accumulated, the real exchange rate will be appreciated. Um, in that situation, uh, there will be a low, uh, 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 a low real rate of, of, uh, of interest uh, because uh, inflation will be expected in terms of the consumption basket. So you can't, you can't really um, discuss the, the, uh, the natural rate the way, the way much of the literature does it. It's the rate at which saving equals investment or the rate at which demand equals supply because neither of those things is going to be true in the open economy. Uh, you can export some of your supply. Uh, saving doesn't have to equal investment if the current account is, is, uh, is uh, not in, in balance. And that's why the classical uh, discussion in open economy macro focuses on external as well as internal balance. Uh, you can't really discuss what the uh, equilibrium policy rate should be if you don't have uh, some notion of where the exchange rate should be. And again, in some models, the exchange rate will line up exactly, but there are models in which it would not. And I think this is a holistic perspective that Governor Mayakawa would um, agree with. Um, let me turn to an issue that um, uh, Governor Ueda raised in his remarks uh, as to, uh, to the future. Of course, we all know that prediction is very hard, especially when it's about the future. But um, there, there is an active debate now about uh, uh, one aspect of the new normal, and that's whether the new normal will involve uh, substantially higher and sustainably higher real interest rates. Um, prior to COVID, uh, Charles Goodhart and um, um, uh, Manoj Pradhan wrote a, uh, a nice book setting out a very, a very detailed case about why the, the future would be inflationary and uh, real interest rates would be higher. And it, the scope of the book is really uh, quite remarkable because it looks at many, many aspects of the problem and also the longer historical con context as to how the, um, the um, huge transformations of, of the world around 1990 uh, in China, in the Soviet bloc, changed the world economy. Um, Larry Summers has more or less endorsed a similar view, um, saying that the age of secular stagnation is over. Um, Olivier Blanchard has, has pushed back on that, and there's a nice debate between them on the Peterson website. Now, this is not the first time that higher real interest rates have been predicted. Um, back in 2010, McKinsey Global Institute uh, issued a study called Farewell to Cheap Capital? Question mark. And they uh, say, we project that by 2020, global investment demand, from 2020 is a couple of years ago, uh, global investment demand could reach levels not seen since the post-war rebuilding of Europe and Japan 
and the era of high growth in mature economies. And their basic premise was that the high investment needs in emerging markets would uh, draw in uh, world capital and um, uh, 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 lead to a much higher global level of real interest rates in line with the sort of Metzler diagram I showed you. Now, of course, we're still struggling with this issue of investment uh, in emerging markets. I showed you the chart of how real interest rates there have been higher than in advanced economies. And part of the, the, the agenda, the very active agenda of um, the World Bank trying to use its capital more uh, efficiently to uh, extend its guarantees to a larger uh, range of borrowing that could be uh, shunted to developing and emerging markets to fund investment is that the, the flow of capital is not uh, um, unimpeded. Uh, in fact, there is still uh, fragmentation. But that being said, this was 2010, and what would be our prediction today? Well, if you look at inflation-protected bond yields, uh, they certainly, to some extent, are predicting, and these are 10-year for Germany, 30-year for the UK and US yields, some rise in rates. Now, again, there, there are many issues about risk premia, liquidity premia, um, so we always want to have a grain of salt, but um, these might indicate some market expectations of higher, higher rates, um, but still, they're not much, they're not much higher. Than, uh, than they were um, uh, around the time of the uh, global financial crisis. So there are many, many factors in, in play. Uh, if you take apart the goodhart pradhan model, um, one is increasing longevity, and this plays a very big role in their analysis. Um, uh, they also predict the decline in inequality as workers' bargaining power rises uh, following the uh, decline in bargaining power that came after the big addition to the global labor force around 1990. And um, uh, post their book, uh, of course, there are a number of other developments which um, Larry Summer cites, the possibility of greater global defense spending, uh, higher investment needs associated with green transition, higher, higher public debts. The demographic trends I find particularly interesting, and um, it's useful to look at some UN projections for two key variables. One is population growth, and you'll note that the UN is predicting negative global population growth by uh, uh, basically by the, the, 20, the 2080s. Um, so that's uh, uh, beyond uh, most of our lifetimes, but, but maybe not uh, everyone in the room. Um, uh, also, uh, the UN is predicting uh, that life expectancy will rise globally, of course, at a, at a, at a, at a, uh, uh, a lower pace and a nice concave function here, but it, it continues to rise through the end of the century. And um, the second of these is what uh, Goodhart and Pradhan focus on. Uh, I don't really find it decisive. Theoretically, longer retirements may imply a higher stock of savings in the economy, uh, and therefore more capital, and therefore a lower marginal product of, of capital. Of course, if populations are shrinking, there's a composition effect which cuts the other way and which could be important. But empirically, um, it turns out that the old don't desave as much as you think they might desave. Um, there's a range of studies. Um, they go back at least to uh, a study on bequest motives by Kotlikoff and Summers in 1981, showing that um, the old continue saving, uh, at least at the higher ranges of the income distribution for bequests and against the... Uh, the, um, uh, the uh, misfortune of living too long, uh, health expenses, 
and detailed calibrated multi-country OG models. There's some great work from the Bank of England on this, uh, also a paper by Adrienne Auclair and co-authors, uh, shows uh, uh, real interest rates continuing to decline due to the demographic factors through much of the, uh, the century. Uh, investment could be lower as workforces age, and the scope for profitable innovation uh, uh, fails to grow or contracts. AI might cut the other way. Uh, so I think for advanced economies, at least, it's hard to be confident of sustained and substantially higher rates. And uh, you can think of this in terms of a, a bit of a scorecard. Uh, of course, there are no, no weights on these, but I think demographics, the weight of the evidence points to continued downward pressure. Uh, productivity is a question mark always. Uh, I don't want to be a Bob Gordon uh, Cassandra, but um, uh, you know we're waiting for the next big productivity innovation, and it could be AI, uh, and that could come sooner or later. Um, Inequality, I, I'm skeptical that this is going to reverse in a big way, uh, especially when around the world we see countries um, turning to uh, industrial policies, which in some countries have the, ex the, the capacity to enrich elites and worsen the income distribution. Uh, global fragmentation is, a, uh, I think, a big, a big negative here in terms of just the, the profitability and the efficiency of investment and uh, uh, that interacts with my, my last item, which is, is ambient uncertainty. Uh, you know, how does, how does one invest when you, when you uh, don't know what geopolitical stress might emerge where, or what legal actions might be taken that radically change the investment environment? And we see these happening all, all around us. I mean, they, they, are, they are not always geopolitically motivated, but you look at the provisions of the... Uh, the uh, um, so-called Inflation Reduction Act in the, in the U.S., and they certainly upended a lot of uh, global investment plans. Uh, and fiscal activism is the one area that I think clearly, clearly, clearly points to higher interest rates. Uh, but uh, fiscal activism has to be sustainable, and with high interest rates, sustainability comes into question. So I think there's a tension there in simply saying, well, Governments will spend more, and um, real interest rates will be higher, and that's the end of the story because it probably won't be the end of the story. So let me let me conclude with with some of the policy implications uh, of low for longer interest rates. These are very obvious, but worth stating them because they they permeate at least three of the spheres of macro policy that concern us. Of course, if, if we have low for long rates, the effective lower bound will continue to bedevil monetary policy, and we'll talk more about whether we should eliminate cash or move to higher inflation targets. Um, for fiscal policy, uh, low rates could be good news for sustainability, but not if they're primarily driven by low growth. Uh, uh, and then there's this um, tension between uh, how much fiscal policy can actually do if interest rates do rise. And finally, uh, one thing I think we've learned, uh, and particularly in recent times, been reminded, is that um, uh, the low interest rate environment can accentuate financial instability threats. Uh, if rates remain low, we will need to increase our level of vigilance, raise our gains as, um, as macroprudential policymakers, and uh, the business models of some financial institutions that, that really rely on uh, a, a, a positive um, interest rate environment, an upward sloping term structure uh, will, will um, come, into, come into question. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Mori. Uh, thanks very much for your insightful presentation. Before I open the floor, let me ask uh, two questions to you. So while others are preparing for the questions, 
Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your name tag so that after these two questions, then I'm going to go around uh, your questions. So in your first part of your paper, your pa first part is a really excellent literature survey on history and concept of a natural interest rate and mutual interest rate, which, as you said, are closely related but not necessarily the same. And as a policymaker, I'm very much interested in how to estimate and uh, implement this neutral rate concept more in our monetary policy setup. Uh, currently, if I look at our Korea's experience, uh, in estimating mutual rate, Bank of Korea used various models, as you cited, uh, Lover, Williams, and many others. But our experience so far suggests that uh, uh, we, ha we tend to rely more on time series and semi-structural model rather than DSG model because, you know, estimate from the dynamic uh, you know, stochastic general equilibrium model seems to vary a little bit too much for us to use it. And especially when you try to incorporate uh, the financial issues and also the global factors, which I really echo that is very important. And when you introduce it, we find that the results are quite varying. So it's in some sense, we have some difficulties in, uh, uh, in incorporating this concept. Conceptually, too, when, when exchange rate moves, depending on how much you allow the exchange rate move, interest rate and the exchange rate are endogenous each other. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, it depends on the how we treat the exchange rate side too. So overall, I think not only we rely on the model, we are now currently relying on quantity measures such as market liquidity, monetary aggregate kind of things. But at the end, my impression is that my friends in monetary policy committee member seems to rely more on the, some kind of ad hoc uh, fact that how much the current inflation conform to the uh, projected path of inflation I think that information seems to be mostly widely used to judge whether our interest rate is above or below the neutral rate. In that sense, I think the quote that you marked by John H. Williams in 1930s, this is a, you know, abstraction, uh, seems to be still a stage of art. So I just wonder whether Bank of Korea, for example, is doing okay, or whether you can suggest something, how, what you can do more to incorporate uh, these global factors as you mentioned. This, that's my first question. Uh, in the second half of your uh, paper, you seem to be more in line with Olivia rather than Larry in uh, predicting that low interest environment will come back. Mm -hmm. So my question is that I hope that Japan's economic success and uh, the wage negotiation at this moment will solve the uh, governor Ueda's headache. But <laughs> just in case if after this high inflation period is over, if low inflation, low for longer environment come back, what kind of options are left for advanced economies, especially Japan? And, uh, and in relation to that, for many emerging markets, we will face a very similar risk. For example, Korea, aging is so severe. Thailand, China also, I think uh, this secular stagnation uh, risk is real. But on the other hand, our currency is not internationalized. So it will be very difficult for us to use QE or some unconventional policy if we face that same risk. And since the, uh, this low for longer phenomena seems to be more driven by the structural factors, I wonder whether the emerging market has to focus more on structural policy rather than monetary and fiscal policy in addressing this issue. So it's a long question, but please you know, give us a guidance for these two questions first. Well, take, taking the second question first, I think you know stru structural policy is is always a uh, a, a, a uh, an important line line of line of defense, just on its on its own terms in terms of raising efficiency, but also for, for easing the path of macro policy, not only in in um, uh, emerging markets but but everywhere. Uh, you know, if you look at the the uh, the uh, uh, current, let's let's hope it passes the Congress agreement uh, between uh, President Biden and Republicans. One of the elements is to um, you know easing the investment permitting process, and that's probably the kind of structural reform that will be positive in terms of uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, Raising the the productivity of investment and uh, 
uh, making investment generally more attractive. And, you know, we can argue about environmental effects, but I suspect that that the uh, red tape that's being cut is not 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 excessive. So, structural policy is always um, always welcome uh, if you can overcome the the political barriers to it. You know, in terms of your first question. Uh, You know, it, 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 it's good to have some benchmark for where the policy rate should be, but I think the central banker has to recognize the, the huge uncertainty. Uh, you don't, you definitely don't want to be totally in the dark. So looking at these different measures is a good thing, provided you don't take them overly seriously because the range of uncertainty is is high. But there's no substitute for looking at a at a at a large range of um, of, uh, um, of variables to to um, see how the economy is responding in real term as one uh, one uh, changes policy. And it's clear that um, all central banks are um, groping toward um, uh, some sort of uh, sense of where infl inflation is going and trying to not push inflation too high. So they're, they're trying to find the natural rate, as it were, by a kind of tatonement process of trial, of trial and error. And I'm not sure there's any, any uh, real um, uh, uh, substitute for that. I mean, even if you, if you knew the natural rate, to, to set your policy rate, uh, your nominal policy rate, you, you would need to know what, what inflation expectations are. And whenever I hear a central banker say, oh, expectations are well anchored, I get very nervous because expectations depend on the central banker's actions. <laughs> so even, even at that level, it's, it's difficult to, to implement, implement the natural rate concept, even if you, even if you know what it is. So uh, you know, a, a paper by Bernanke and Woodford looks at this type of problem. It's a very old paper, 25 years old. But their solution is you've got to look at a lot of data, a lot of indicators, and there's no, no substitute for that. You can try to use those to forecast inflation, to see where your policy is driving the economy, uh, but more information will always be better. Thank you. I take it as you're saying we are doing okay. <laughs> okay, so let me get uh, two questions at once and then, you know, we'll move around. So first, uh, Marcus and Hassan Asius, and then we'll move around. Please. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a great lecture. And in particular, I like the distinction between our bar and our star. And I was wondering, you alluded to when you look at financial frictions, uh, it's more longer than our bar, but what happens if you know this, you have to fly to safety events and suddenly the, not only the risk premium moves, but also the risk-free rate moves around? How would this fit in this R star versus R bar framework? Do you need an R double star for these uh, type of settings? So that's my first question. The second question is that, um, you know, one big puzzle is also given this low interest rate environment, why is investment so weak? Why didn't investment go up? And when you alluded to what's happening in the future, uh, you emphasized, the, you mentioned the green transitions on the side, but do you think it's small compared to the demographic shifts? Um, some people would argue the green transition will lead to a huge investment boom because we have to replace a large part of the capital stock with green capital stock. Do you think that it's a big shift into our star or it will change it quite a bit? Or do you think it's, you know, 20 basis points? So how, do you have ever seen any quantification? Do you have a hunch? how big the, the green transition is compared to demographics. And finally, uh, do you see also some signs of financial repression keeping our star low in a sense that, uh, you know, we have this huge fiscal expansion, the sustainability issues you mentioned. One way to, you know, make it sustainable is to impose more financial repression. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, 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 I will relate uh, somewhat uh, uh, my question to to what we had from the chair and, and Mark was just uh, just before. Uh, is two issues. One is the short short run advice on uh, treating uh, uncertainty or uh, our ignorance about uh, our star uh, or our bar. Uh, 
And uh, as, as you mentioned, Mori, uh, one of the ways to, to deal with this is, is by feeling, uh, central banks feeling their way into what is the uh, uh, correct uh, 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 level of interest rates. And this really uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is very much along the lines of what, uh, of what uh, Knut Wicksell had, uh, had suggested at the end of the uh, 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 19th century when he said, he, after identifying the, the construct, you should never, never, never try to hit it, estimate it and hit it, which is exactly the discussion you guys had. Uh, but the question I had was on advice to central banks uh, um, about uh, 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 how to deal with uh, the uh, very different outcomes we may face. Uh, one outcome is that uh, the equilibrium real interest rate uh, stays low for the next several years. Mm -hmm. Um, but another outcome is that the equilibrium real interest rate rises. Uh, if it rises 200 basis points, which would be very much in line with historical standards, uh, then in light of the high debt levels we have, both government debt have, have, uh, uh, levels and household non-financial non sector, very high debt levels in, in, uh, in, in numerous uh, countries, the economic consequences of dealing with that would be very high. So knowing those two outcomes uh, and how different uh, the consequences would be, what is the advice that we should be giving to central banks and other policymakers now about how to prepare for those contingencies? Thank you. Um, you know, whether, whether you're in the low interest rate or the high interest rate environment, um, there are going to be financial stability risks. So it's sort of, you know, but, but coming at different, at different, uh, in different time frames, right? If interest rates go up, debt burdens are higher. Um, uh, that is going to be a huge financial stability challenge. Uh, and we, we see some, some, uh, 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 glimmerings of that, <laughs> even even now, uh, I think. But I, I think that the, the response to bo both of those environments is really to, you know, raise the game in terms of macro prudential surveillance and financial stability policy, and to really try to uh, game out game out these these threats um, and um, put in place the. Um, the kind of frameworks where they could be better handled, and that could be, uh, uh, you know, depending on the country, bankruptcy frameworks, resolution frameworks, but also um, uh, in the low interest environments, the different sorts of ex ante anti policy. So I think I think the key is to 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 sort of rec recognize the threats. You know, we look at Silicon Valley Bank, and nobody it apparently didn't occur to anybody that. <laughs> You know uh, that a portfolio that like that could suffer big losses in an environment of tightening monetary policy. Um, I, I don't. I think there are a lot of threats that are that are knowable, and uh, you know it requires really taking a closer look at uh, balance sheets in in sensitive in sensitive sectors. Um, on the um, uh, Marcus's questions. Um, uh, you know, I don't. I don't have an estimate on the green transition and what the uh, the effect could be. Uh, we, we we sort of have to have to see it happen within within the budgetary constraints. Um, uh, uh, you know, a full out and rapid transformation, which is probably what would be best from a climate standpoint. I think is 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 not likely to be to be in the cards and um, the sort of. Um, uh, Subsidy policies, or 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 uh, in the U.S. or the carbon uh, uh, pricing policies, and more in the EU, are, are I don't think are, are likely to to move us very very rapidly to where we to where we need to be. So um, yeah, in principle, this could be a big a big uh, factor, and I'd like to see it be a big factor. But I wonder about the politics the politics of that. Um, you know, already in the U.S. Um, you know, there was an attempt to roll back climate provisions, which seems provisionally to have failed. But it is a uh, uh, it is a uh, 
you know, a compromise, the debt ceiling compromise will uh, be, represents to some degree a fiscal contraction relative to the expected path. And uh, 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 this could also be in, in, in store in other, in other places. Um, a flight to safety shock. Um, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing I, I, I was talking about. If, if, uh, if uh, you know, there's a sudden inflow of capital to a country, um, uh, uh, this could cut different, different ways in terms of R star, depending on, you know, how contractionary is the resulting exchange rate depreciation. It might actually be expansionary. So it's going to, it's going to be an empirical matter. And this, this gets to the point that, you know, there's no simple mapping which says, you know, if you have a current account deficit, R star is higher. I think for the U.S. in the um, early 2000s, that was likely the case, where the Fed should have been looking at this huge current account deficit instead, and instead of saying, oh, it's all made in Asia, you know, it's not us, it's them, uh, asking the question, you know, is there something going on in our financial markets and our housing markets that should give us pause where we should be doing something differently? And this, this gets to the, the, the question of, you know, financial stability that Athanasios raised. Um, and uh, yeah, I still have to read the New York Fed blog on R star star, which looks very, very interesting. Um, financial repression, um, uh, intentional or unintentional could, could be something that is um, turned to by countries. Uh, even if you look at something like Basel III, you could argue that liquidity requirements, um, liquidity coverage ratios raise the demand for, you know, safe treasuries, uh, uh, um, and that that is something you could argue is a form of financial repression. On the other hand, there are other elements of Basel III, um, you know, the leverage ratios, which which may very well, uh, you know, reduce reduce demand because. You know, relatively low yielding safe assets take up balance sheet space and uh, 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 institutions don't want to devote it to holding treasury. So uh, again, you know, as, as financial regulation um, evolves, and I think it is going to evolve, um, different, different, different measures could have, could have the effect of um, uh, 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 effectively being financial Repression, but um, you know, one of the, one of the lessons, one of the recent lessons is that you know, when we say safe assets, <laughs> we have to really, you know, look very deeply into what we're talking about and what the possible shocks are. So we will get a question from Pierre Olivier and the Governor Bailey, and after the Mori answer, we have uh, Doctor Smets and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Doctor Iwata and Doctor Watanabe will ask a question, and we'll see whether we have enough time left. Okay, so uh, Pierre, Olivier. Well, thank you, Chang Young, and a very, uh, very insightful lecture. Uh, thank, thank you, Maury. Uh, a couple of observations, and I think that already came up in the exchange with uh, with Marcus and uh, Athanasius. The uh, I think that this distinction between our bar and our star is is, is really important. Um, back in the early 2010s or mid 2010s. Um, I mean, actually, no, before, the, in, around 2005, 2006, uh, Alan Greenspan was complaining about it, the inability of the, you know, Fed increasing the short rates to move the long rates. And the, so the, the, the Greenspan conundrum at the time, um, I think, is a good illustration of the kind of uh, financial uh, mm -hmm. uh, external shock that you are, uh, you, you're talking about. I could, in fact, explain why you have estimates of the Lubak William that are above what the, what the Fed was actually able to implement in terms of uh, long rates. The second observation is you started with a parallel between the, um, you know, 2008 period around the time of the first uh, uh, Maikawa uh, lecture, and now there is another, I think, uh, parallel that is interesting, which is the pattern of global imbalances. In 2022, it looks very similar to what we had in uh, in 2008. Um, in other words, I mean, you, you, it was the case that we had large surpluses from China, and there were large surpluses from oil producers at the time, relatively uh, 
um, balanced the current account for the euro area and large deficits uh, for for the U.S. And that's again the pattern that we're seeing. That we're seeing uh, in 2022. That I guess one difference might be Japan surpluses are are smaller now because of the high energy prices. Um, but this is this is interesting uh, in part because uh, in the context of uh, the discussion on on uh, fragmentation that uh, has been mentioned by Governor Ueda, uh, uh, you know, we have all kinds of talks about um, decoupling between the West mm -hmm. and China. But when you look at current accounts, you just don't see it. And in fact, if anything, it, it, mm -hmm. you have surpluses from countries that are in supposedly to be in one block and deficits in the other countries. So clearly the financial flows are, are there. But that uh, um, relates to the discussion on, I think, on our star, because it also suggests that if there was stronger financial fragmentation, then each block would revert to its autarky, uh, autarky uh, real rate. And, and potentially that would increase the, uh, the real rate in the, in, in, in the US and other Western countries and, and probably depress it. In, in China and other countries that are uh, generating surpluses uh, right now, so I think that's that's one uh, that's one con uh, concern uh, going forward. Uh, and quickly, one uh, one comment to to uh, also address uh, Marcus question on the green transition and the impact on our star. This is something we looked at in our uh, World Economic Outlook chapter um, in April, and in fact, somewhat surprisingly, we find that the green transition would tend to depress our star, not increase it. It de the details depend on how it's financed. If it's financed by debt, then it tends to increase it, at least in the short term. But the, the, the green transition itself, if you have a budget neutral green transition, tends to depress our star. Now, the reason is that, uh, of course, you have a lot of investment in green stuff, but you also have a lot of divestment in, in brown stuff. Um, and and um, if you have, say, a climate transition that is financed by a carbon tax or something like that, then the net effect is to raise the cost of capital, and, and so you have a lower investment level overall. Governor Bailey. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mario. It was a fascinating talk. Uh, three points I wanted to just make. I think the first one is that I would start from the sort of presumption that our bar and our star would not generally equal each other mm -hmm. um, on the basis that our bar, as you say, is more of a structural long-run measure and our star is more of a, I'll use the phrase a bit loosely here, a bit more of a cyclical measure to take account of shocks. Um, and I think that's, you know, you mentioned Silicon Valley Bank, for instance. I think that's helpful in understanding that because in the sense that the root of the problem is interest rate risk mm -hmm. and how you deal with it in a, in a sort of regulatory framework, I think the fact, you know, arguably that the framework didn't allow for an increase in our star uh, and the consequences of that passing through uh, into the banking system is, is relevant. Second thing, I, I wonder if we've, put too much focus on this, this question about the saving investment balance since the financial crisis. Um, not because it's wrong, it's, the, the story is absolutely right, but because alongside that we've had a fiscal policy story, more of a structural fiscal policy story at least, which is about you know, who pays for the aging population uh, and this question about, uh, about fiscal policy versus disaving. The third one, I want to pick up the point you just made about inflation expectations, because I think it, it, it's really important and it's very hard. It sort of goes back to what Governor Ueda was saying about communication by central banks. I, 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 thought, I thought you were rightly saying, uh, rightly in the sense of saying, you know, central banks really need to be rather more sort of subtle about and, and thoughtful about what they say about inflation expectations. Uh, I, the counter I would make is, you know, the central bank that comes out and sort of implies that inflation expectations are not anchored. Um, is, as I think someone once said, taking a brave move, put it that way. And so, you know, the consequence is that, and, and I've seen this, you, you fall back on the their anchored statement. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, uh, Pierre Olivier, I'm glad you brought up the Greenspan conundrum because it's a great, it's a great example of how, you know, general financial conditions matter, you know, the, and the, um, uh, you know, an another example in the same vein was um, Paul Volcker um, uh, basically um, not be being puzzled that um, that long-term interest rates weren't coming down in line with what he was projecting about the stance of monetary policy. You know, if they believe me, long-term rates should be falling, but long-term rates were not falling for a long time. So, 
that meant he had to be higher for longer <laughs> to really convince convince the markets. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I agree with with Andrew that that um, one one has to be very careful about admitting that you have to convince the markets, or you know how one how one discusses that. On the um, you know the global imbalances, um, you know I think I think to to fully understand the effects of fragmentation, we we would have to ask, you know how how actually how did, did these imbalances close, and what are the collateral what's what's the collateral damage so um uh you know there were there were some proposals in the u.s congress a couple of years ago um coming from an unlikely duo of far right and far left senators and when two people like that agree on anything you know it's a really really bad idea but it was to um uh give the fed a a target for a for the um net export deficit of the u.s and to have them tax capital flows, you know, to bring to bring them net capital flows to bring the net exports in line with the target, and um, uh, you know, the idea that this would not have led to a huge investment collapse in the U.S. if Congress actually passed such a law and gave such a responsibility to the Fed, you know, is is not plausible. So, uh, you know, frag fragmentation is 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 coming. With causes which can can really affect the investment environment and and the saving environment in different ways, um, uh, yeah. And I, I appreciate Andrew Bailey's remark about R bar not not necessarily equaling R star. Um, uh, I, I would agree that that um, uh, R star is, is really capturing much more much more temporary factors. And in the you know in the in the example I gave uh, of this. Um, flexible price open economy model, you might take the view that um, uh, uh, R bar is sort of determined by some long run sustainable external balance. Whereas clearly in the short run, what, what is happening to, to the demand for net exports is, is pushing around the rate that the central bank would, would have to set to be consistent with the flexible price equilibrium. Let's get the uh, last set of questions, given the interest of time. Dr. Smets. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so, so Maury, you, you emphasize very much the open economy aspects of, of um, our star and particularly the role of the current account. My question is, is a bit related to what Pierre Olivier said about the impact of financial uh, integration. Could you sp speculate a little bit about uh, the international role of the U.S. dollar and, and the fact that, as a result, basically sets a benchmark for kind of our star for many other countries and how the geopolitical uh, tensions can can sort of affect that. Uh, Dr. Iwata. I have one question and one comment. I very much impressed your explanation on this role of the current account deficit and the surplus on the r -star divergence uh, between r -star and r -ba. But uh, if uh, this theory is correct, widening imbalance in individual uh, economies would imply the widening divergence of r -star individual countries. So, but uh, if I look at the chart you presented in the gro global imbalance, there had been a wider, so a widening uh, external imbalance early 2000. Uh, and so, but uh, at the same time, we see the strong convergence of uh, ex post real interest rate, uh, very strong. And uh, it seems to me there is no well correspondence between this wider divergence of external imbalance and the uh, uh, real interest rate development actual world. And uh, also, I think what is important is this uh, uh, current balance must be balanced in the world economy. Therefore, individual difference you know, uh, may occur with respect to r -star, but the global r -star is determined by the global investment, the global saving. And the current balance would not affect on this global you know, natural interest rate. And second is uh, comment is the policy implication. The real rate is continue to be lower than the growth rate. This is a widening some fiscal space, 
but too much spending done in the corona crisis. I find that advanced economies, almost all the countries, no sustainability, even though we take into account interest rate is lower than the uh, GDP rate, uh, growth rate. I've, unfortunately, this is uh, according to the um, uh, uh, Goldilocks fiscal theory, uh, just following up this article and find uh, now Japan and the United States, even the United Kingdom, outside the you know uh, sustainability region even we are given the fact their interest rate is lower than real growth rate that's uh, that implication is notably in the case of the united states you have the high dollar value cycle and uh, when to what extent external imbalance is sustainable you know if you us uh, a, this uh, natural R star is higher than other part of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watanabe. Thank you. And I have a quick, uh, quick question about the uh, impact of uh, the pandemic on, 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 on the real interest rate. And um, uh, we had a lot of uh, pandemics in, in past, like uh, uh, Black Death or Spanish flu and so on. And uh, papers based on the data uh, from those uh, episodes tell that the capital labor ratio uh, uh, increased after the pandemic. And that wa that's why real wage uh, uh, increased after the pandemic. And also real rate interest rate declined after the pandemic. And uh, uh, do you think any other thought? Do you have any other any thought on on this sort of issue, and uh, what will happen after the pandemic? Uh, we we would be different, or we will be the same as, as before. <clears throat> yeah, um, Tsutomu's question first. Um, I guess if you look at this long, eight centuries of data that Rogoff and co-authors put together. Um, you find that you have the Black Death in 1348, which wipes out a large fraction of the labor force, uh, helps set set off a uh, uh, a big a big uh, ri rise in wages. Uh, 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 um, uh, you know, probably lower, lowers the marginal lowers the marginal product of capital, but I think it's true that in their data the the actual interest rate r rises. Is that correct? Yeah. So that's that is a puzzle, and uh, um, not being a medieval historian, I can't really I can't really resolve it. Um, you know, I don't I don't I don't I don't view the most recent pandemic as as being as fundamental in that way. I mean, it's certainly. Had impacts on the labor force, on uh, on uh, uh, people retiring early, on participation differing in different countries. But I, I think those are mostly short run, short run factors, relatively speaking. Um, on the the global imbalances and the uh, declining uh, path of real interest rates. Remember, these are these are long term, you know, ten year rates, and so. It's not surprising that 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 uh, that um, they're they're somewhat smooth with respect to global imbalances, um, uh, uh, but in th in theory, um, you know, there there, there will be a, a global R star, which could be the average R star, but it's not going to be the same for every country. So um, I think you need a more detailed analysis to say something about the the links between. Uh, uh, Current accounts and and our stars, and again, I think that's going to depend on the shocks that are that are driving the current accounts for different different countries. Um, you know, on, on Frank's question, uh, uh, geopolitical tensions. I mean, I, th I think those kind of have to be negative for investment and positive for saving at some level. And um, uh, but that, but that being said. Um, you know, it's it's clear that in thinking about you know what has been going on in monetary policy, the central role of the dollar and um, Fed policy uh, is is actually critically important to to 
all central bank decisions outside of the Fed. I dare say even even the ECB. <laughs> um, uh, some of the speeches uh, from last year indicated that euro depreciation against the dollar was a concern. So um, um, uh, this this sort of reinforces my point that. Um, you know, if you're if you're trying to look at, at the inflation stabilizing interest rate, trying to find that R star, um, you, you do have to worry about what's going on in the exchange rate and the external sector, because um, uh, if there's a you know a dollar shock coming from abroad, that's going to be a first order, a first order importance under current conditions. Now, if if the fragmentation of the global economy uh, extends to um, a uh, diminishment of the dollar's role, and you know, I would I would have thought that a default on U.S. debt would certainly push in push in that direction. Uh, then uh, then we could move to a much more multi uh, polar currency world where the the U.S. influence would would decline. But as things stand now, uh, um, you know, I think network externalities support the dollar's position and. Absent some really major shock, it's not clear to me what is going to uh, dislodge that, at least over the next uh, decade or so. Thanks for the active participation from the floor. But uh, we are in Japan, and punctuality, punctu punctuality, punctuality is very matter. So uh, I, I'm afraid I have to close the session. And Mori, thanks very much. You're a great teacher. And we, as always, we learn a lot today. Let's give him a good applause. Thank you.